Semen, Chapter 6, pages 51 through 57. Winter Among the Indians, October 1804 through April 1805. Autumn came to the Missouri River. Along the banks, leaves changed from green to gold. As the Corps of Discovery made its way upstream, the boats were surrounded by creatures on the move. The sky was filled with flocks of honking, squonk, squawking geese and ducks headed south to warmer waters. Large herds of elk and antelope crossed the river, migrating south like the fall. A hearty wind ruffled Seaman's new winter coat. Chilly nights killed off the mosquitoes and the river's water sparkled in the clear sunshine. In early October, the explorers began to see abandoned villages along the banks of the Missouri. A passing trapper said the Arakara Indians once lived in all these earth lodges, but most of the tribe had been killed by smallpox over the last 25 years. Only a few thousand Arakaras had survived, and they lived on one small island. The trappers also said these Indians sometimes joined with the Sioux to attack the tribes living further up the river. After the unpleasant dealings with the Teton Sioux, the captains wondered if the Arakaras would welcome outsiders. The expedition soon reached the island where the Arakaras lived in four villages. On October 8th, Lewis told some of the men, took some of the men out to meet the Indians. Two days later, the captains held a formal meeting with them, including the usual speech, military display, and gift giving. The captains offered whiskey to the Arakaras, but their chief refused. Recalling the meeting with the Teton Sioux Indian chiefs, the captains were both surprised and relieved. The Arakaras gave a warm welcome to their visitors. They escorted the explorers through their villages and proudly showed off their carefully tended vegetable gardens. When the Indians offered some of their harvest, the men rejoiced. For months they had eaten mostly meat and a little wild fruit. They longed for the corn, squash, and beans that the Indians cultivated. As the explorers toured the Arakara villages, curious Indians trailed after them, staring. The Indians avoided seamen, who was much larger and darker than their village dogs. They pointed at the explorers' clothing and beards, but most of the attention was fo focused on, on York. None of, the, none of the Arakaras had ever seen a black man. The adult villager said York was big medicine. Some of the village children darted between the explorer's legs to peek at this amazing black-skinned man. York found the Indians' curiosity amusing. He pretended not to hear the children approach. Then he would suddenly turn on them and roar. When the children scattered like frightened mice, York laughed until his belly ached. Halloo! he hollered, showing his arm muscles and making loud growling noises. Here strides the York beast. York leaped at some children. They yelped, scurrying away to hide behind their lodges. Seaman watched the commotion until he was sure it was a game. Then he barked playfully and ran circles around York. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Now the York beast has come. York laughed heartily at his own joke and stamped his foot to make Seaman run faster. Beware, York howled fiercely at a small Indian faces peeping around the sides of the larges. York was fished from the blackest depths of the sea by Master Clark, tamed in the farthest recesses of caves where hairy monsters dwell. York picked up a heavy log and hoisted it above his head to show off his strength. Touch York the beast at your peril. His favorite food is children. York, that's enough, ordered Clark, shaking his head and trying not to smile. If you keep it up, the Arakaras will take your joke seriously. We don't want to mislead these kind people. After spending a few pleasant days with the Arakaras, the expedition proceeded on. By the end of October, the explorers were entering the territory of the M Mandan Indians. The captains had heard of the Mandan from trappers and traders, and they hoped to set up winter camp near these Indians. On the 24th of October, the Corps met a Mandan hunting party. Some of the explorers could sign or speak a few words of the Mandan language, and the Mandans had learned a few English words from the passing traders. 
After a friendly introduction, the chief of the hunting party invited the explorers to his village. Lewis took Seaman and some of the men while Clark and the rest made camp. Lewis and Seaman walked briskly beside Man the Mandan chief. The Indian pointed out fields where his people grew corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, and tobacco. When the explorers entered the village, they passed about 40 low circular living huts surrounding a large open space. The most important villagers lived close to the central plaza, which contained a single cedar post and a big lodge. As in the Arakara villages, Indians came out of their huts to watch the newcomers. The little curly-tailed village dog sniffed at seamen, but he ignored them and stayed close to Lewis. The Mandans were friendly, and they didn't stare and point at the explorers. They were used to all types of visitors because their villages were the central marketplace of the region. Indians from many friendly tribes came to trade, bring li bringing livestock, produce, and furs, buffalo hides, blankets, clothing, and firearms, even musical instruments in the late summer. The Mandan villages overflowed with traders from the Crow, Cree, Kiowa, Cheyenne, Assinibola, and Arapaho tribes. American traders from St. Louis as well as British and Canadian traders from the Northwest and Hudson Bay companies also journeyed to the Mandan villages. Back in camp, Lewis described the Mandan village to Clark. The Mandans are peaceful farmers just like the trappers told us, he said cheerfully. They've been trading with white people for years. If we build our winter camp near here, we'll get along fine with our neighbors. Lewis was in a great mood. He tossed a stick for seamen to retrieve. When the dog brought it back, Lewis snatched it and hid it behind his back. Seaman lowered his head and front paws and barked, his rear end sticking up and his tail wagging. Lewis laughed and tickled Seaman's whiskers with the stick. Then he rolled the dog onto his back and rubbed his belly. Seaman wiggled away and bounded around the captains, barking happily. The Mandans seemed friendly and helpful, Lewis continued, his enthusiasm bursting through his words. I think they have enough corn for their people and for trading with us during the winter. Lewis tossed the stick again and Seaman pounced on it. Clark was holding a hot stone wrapped in flannel against his sore neck. Sometimes he was troubled by rheumatism and the condition had been bothering him for the last few days. His mood was somber. He waited while Lewis played with Seaman. Then he asked, How many villages are located nearby and how many natives live in these villages? The Mandan chief said there are five villages in this area, two Mandan and three Hadassah. From what I saw and heard, I'd estimate the Indian population at more than 4,000 in all the villages combined. Merriweather, that's more people than live in St. Louis, exclaimed Clark. Or in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. How many are warriors, Clark po asked pointedly. Lewis thought for a minute. Maybe a quarter of the population, I guess. As he worked out the arithmetic and considered the expedition's safety, he frowned. Seaman sat down with the stick in his mouth, watching Lewis. When Lewis spoke, Seaman wagged his tail hopefully, but Lewis ignored the stick and looked at Clark. Seaman stretched himself out with a noisy grunt, dropped the stick on the ground, and laid his chin on his front paws. Almost a thousand warriors are living in the five villages altogether, Lewis concluded. Clark raised his eyebrows and looked at Lewis. The Mandans sound friendly enough, Mer Merriweather, but remember, we have fewer than 30 men in the Corps of Discovery and another 20 men in the group that will return to St. Louis next spring. That's fewer than 50 fighting men compared to a thousand Indian warriors. We must maintain a heavy guard until we're very sure we can trust these people. Of course, Lewis nodded thoughtfully. We'll keep to the system we always use when there's a threat. Only one of us at a time will leave our camp. The other will command the soldiers guarding our supplies. On October 29th, the captains held a formal meeting with the Mandans. Lewis gave his speech. The explorers staged a military display. And the Indian chiefs were given small gifts. After the meeting, Lewis had a talk with Black Cat, one of the most powerful Mandan chiefs. Black Cat spoke plainly. When the Indians of the different villages heard of your coming, they all came in from hunting to see. They expected great presents. 
They were disappointed, and some were dissatisfied. Black Cat did not mean these words as a threat. He was simply explaining his people's feelings to the white captain. Lewis listened quietly and spoke in a calm, reassuring voice. He remembered his recent discussion with Clark. The explorers would be surrounded by thousands of Indians for the winter months. They all needed to stay calm and try to understand each other. The Corps began building their winter quarters on November 2nd, 1804. They chose a spot on the eastern side of the Missouri near the mouth of the Knife River. The location offered plenty of fresh water, wood, and game. It was across the river from one of the Mandan villages, so trading with the Indians would be easy. The men felled heavy trees to construct the walls of the fort, which they laid out in a great triangle. With rows of huts inside the stockade, they des designed the fort to resist attacks. With 18-foot walls, a sentry post, and a killboat swivel gun mounted as a cannon. From the first days of construction, Indians came to see Fort Mandan. They were intrigued by such a large structure. Curious Indians hung around all day and slept in the explorer's camp at night. The, camp the captains worried about the security with Indians coming and going so casually. But as the days passed peacefully, the captains relaxed. Before long, all the explorers considered their neighboring Indians their, their friends. The soldiers began to visit the Mandan and Hadassah's villages, often spending the night sleeping in the Indian huts. Seamen, like the captains, eyed the Indian visitors suspiciously at first. He snapped at the Indian dogs if they came too close. But as the days passed and the explorers accepted the Indians as friends, Seaman allowed visitors to stroke his fur. He recognized the squaws who offered him chunks of dried meat. He exchanged greeting sniffs with the Indian dogs, and he sometimes chased them playfully. When he, when he accompanied Shannon or York or Coulter to the Indian villages, Seaman loved to play with the children. He crouched close to the ground and wagged just the tip of his tail so the children would not be afraid to approach him. Trappers, as well as Indians, came to Fort Mandan to visit. The captain spent long hours chatting with the trappers, trying to learn about landmarks farther up the Missouri River. They sketched maps based on the trappers' accounts. The captains asked questions about the Indian tribes who lived out west, about their languages and customs, and about how they felt about whites. Lewis and Clark took notes on everything they heard. One of the trappers was Saint Charbonneau, a 46-year-old French-Canadian living with the Hadassah's Indians. He spoke the Hadassah's language as well as French and some English, and he, had, and he had Indian wives who knew the languages of the tribes living further up the river. Charbonneau offered to come along on the expedition as an interpreter. He even offered to take one of his wives to help translate. The captains were interested in Charbonneau's offer, but they wanted to get to know him before deciding to hire him. Charbonneau's wives made their first visit to the camp on November 11th when the fort was being built. They brought four buffalo robes to the captains. Both wives were teenagers from the Shoshone, a tribe that lived near the Rocky Mountains. The two girls had been captured by the Hadassah Indians in a raid, and Charbonneau had purchased both of them. One of Charbonneau's wives was a slender young woman with braids down her back. Her swollen stomach showed she was pregnant. She introduced herself as Sacagawea, a Hadassah's word that means bird woman. After delivering the buffalo ro robe, Sacagawea watched the men building the fort. Her calm, gentle manner attracted seamen. Sacagawea seemed frightened by the big dog, but George Shannon reassured her by telling seamen to sit and by stroking the dog's head. Sacagawea smiled, then she held out her hand for the dog to smell. Seaman licked his, her fingers, then nudged her hand so she would stroke his fur. Sacagawea giggled. She looked at Shannon and made the Indian side for bear. Shannon laughed and said, I guess Seaman does look like a bear cub, but he's as gentle as a kitten.